time, or we can say that this is not, this has been something that human, human mind has been fascinated by. If somebody can tell you something about who you are and what your future is going to be, you go even if you don't, even if there's an element of disbelief, you will go out of interest and curiosity. Of course, you want to know. Somebody tells you this is going to happen, you will listen just out of interest study, even if it is, even if there's a huge part of you that's saying, I don't believe it. But this is a discipline of science. Okay, there's a discipline of science called chronology. We have just rapidly shut it underneath the carpet, right? Now what I want to open up is the possibility that we are getting certain things spectacularly wrong in today's day and time. And 400 down years down the road, new ways of looking at things may tell us that we are spectacularly wrong even now. We've got to be open to the possibility that sometimes we get things spectacularly wrong. Now let's go back and say, is there a nugget of an idea here? That is right. Yes, it's wrong, no question. But is there a small nugget of an idea that is right? What is the idea? That function is located in different parts. That idea is actually correct. There's no question that the nervous system processes, for example, posture. I can't stand here without my cerebellum. Okay, I won't be able to hold my balance. So that idea that function is located in places is right. In this form, it is wrong. But that conceptual nugget of truth there is interesting and worth pursuing. You would not have done this without, in some ways, a railroad accident happening in the United States. This is Phineas Gage, he was a railroad worker. This is the time of laying long tracks in the United States, the logging industry, people pulling things back and forth. So he was laying tracks and for which he needed dynamite. So the dynamite industry is also happening along the way here, right? So you have this man laying this dynamite and one of the gods pierced his as it blew in the wrong direction and it went in here and came out through here, right? So the thing is with the nervous system injuries, you don't have pain perception inside your brain. While your pain perception perceive pain inside your brain, your brain itself cannot be pain when you stimulate it. So he was still quite okay once they did a little bit of, you know, handle the peripheral damage and there was substantial peripheral damage that's in right there. But over time he recovered. I mean, he did recover and he lived his life. But what people notice this accident happened in the 1840s is that his personality completely changed. Gage was this really, you know, happy good, lucky good person who had lots and lots of friends. They became crude, uncaring, impulsive, irrational, and antisocial. Now, what were they to do? It could have been the trauma of the accident, or it could have been the part of the brain that was damaged. We know now, over time, that it is clear to the part of the brain that's damaged. The ventromedial region of the frontal lobes regulates processing of emotion, regulates control of subcortical circuits. And so, this is the first set of experiments that happened by other loop. Something happened to somebody, somebody observed something and noted, my goodness, this is what happened. So, we are now moving a good solid 50 years from the time of the phrenology and the bumps on the head, the people begin to realize, hey, you can change certain functions. This person is able to walk perfectly okay, they're able to talk perfectly okay, but they've lost a certain control over impulsivity and emotional behavior. At round about that same period of time, you have lots and lots of doctors who in that era did something that doctors today have forgotten not to do. They've forgotten to talk to their patients, right? They had time, they had very little treatment, so what they could they realize is one of the best ways you can make a patient feel better is to listen to your patient. Even if you can't give them any therapy, you can make them feel a lot better than they were where they were if you were simply willing to hear. But also, as a great clinician and diagnostician, you can find out things if you watch carefully. Observation has been the tool of science from the beginning of time, doesn't matter what tools you're using. So you have Broca and you have Wernicke. Within a decade of each other, they diagnose something called Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. Broca's aphasia is caused when this area of the brain is damaged. Wernicke's is caused when this area of the temporal lobe is damaged. In this aphasia, e, patients can understand. So they understand everything I'm saying, but they can't communicate. So if you ask them later, what did the Rita say in her talk? They might tell you, talk, pray. It, but can't put anything in it. comes to that thing I've said, right? These patients will hear these extremely complex sentences but cannot understand. Right? So they're not there's no speech deficit in terms of being able to create complex speech architecture. So I'll give you an example. Let's look at it. Here's suppose I said, 
the dog needs to go out, so I will take him for a walk. This is a sentence, and I could say it to a broker station, and I could say it to a Burlingi station, and say, come, give me a response. A broker station will say, walk dog, which is conceptually somewhere right, that's what I'm trying to say, but they can't create sentence construction and speech production when it comes to serious talk. A Burlingi station will say, you know that smoothen tinker and that I want to get him round and take care of him like he want before. Right? So this is a complex sentence in its architecture. It has individual words that make some sense, but in its entirety the sentence doesn't make any sense. Right? So now this is observation. Patients' brains were looked at later by doctors and anatomists and they identified the structures that are important for speech production, control of speech production and control for speech perception. Okay. So this, this is the beginning of the map making harana. Why am I saying map making? It's beginning to tell you where speech control production of speech is being regulated in the brain. But the biggest sort of discoveries of this time happened with William Penfield. William Penfield in the 1950s was a doctor in McGill University at Montreal Neurological Institute. And this was the sort of mecca where patients who had epilepsy, which was not responding to any form of treatment, went. Because what he would do is do open brain surgery, open up the flap of the skull, and then take out the part of the brain that is responsible for producing a seizure. Now, when you're taking this out, you also want to make sure you're not taking out something really important to the human being. So, because he had the patient there, he would take an electrode and walk along with the electrode and stimulate and say, What well, is happening? The person's under general global anesthesia, so they can answer completely, right? So, he would walk. Like let's say he walked down the motor cortex, he would walk here and he would notice that if he stimulated here, the person starts following. Right? You stimulate here, the tongue starts moving. You stimulate here, you get jaw movement because this is motor cortex. The entire stretch that's motor cortex. So you are now creating a motor map of your body and the parts of your brain that control the motor nerves that are supplying nerve information to the muscle that controls your jaw, your lips, your face, your eye, right? So you can actually map the entire motor control system. Much the same way you can map those parts of your body, how they are mapped to here. For example, if I tickle your toe, then the nerves are eventually conducting information to this part of sensory cortex and that's where you will perceive touch or tickle or pressure or fluttering on your toe. That's the part of your brain that is processing this information. Okay, now we are at the midpoint of my talk, so I need to wake up my audience. So I need to make you guys do an experiment. Okay, so everyone wake up, take out two pencils or two pens or whatever you have. Okay, anything that you have. And I need a volunteer who might can do an experiment. Aruna? Not you. I need a, I need one volunteer. Somebody who's willing to become my guinea pig. Where's it come from? But you need two pens or two pencils or two whatever. Yeah, I I give you two similar pens or two pencils. And you're going to do this experiment on your neighbor, okay? So if you have a, a neighbor who's cooperative or not, also not if they're if they're not cooperative, you can still request them. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is look to see if you touch this person so they ask them or him to close their eyes and then hold up their hand to you hand and forearm so I'm going to need your hand and forearm and I'm going to touch her with either two or one and she's going to tell me can I feel one, can I feel two and you're not no guessing they attempt to really say what you feel because that's an allergy of 50% target right close your eyes and just respond and ideally you would do each experiment at least 10 times to see what is the likelihood that she's detecting one versus two. But for now we'll do it the simple way. You want to put it again? It's not sit. Sit here. Sit here and rest it now. Yeah, that's good. Okay? So you can just do this experiment with your neighbor. Alright? Don't look. Rest, rest your hand. I'm going to touch you with one or two and you tell me what you feel. Okay? So she says she feels two. Alright? Okay, so she says one here, two. This is the same distance. I didn't change the distance here at all. And over time, if I do this over and over again, she will detect two beautifully at the tips of her fingers. She can 
cannot do this here because there is one sensory receptor covering the area here. There are multiple sensory receptors in the tips of your fingers. This is what we use to explore your universe. We are not walking around feeling like this, right? So we don't really care about uh, receptors being widely distributed here. Okay, we're going to continue. Okay, all right. Close your eyes.
Okay? Sus hands, sus tongue, sus face, sus lips, look at this. Okay? So territories are not permanently fixed, they are open to being reorganized. If they're open to being reorganized, you can imagine what experience is doing. It's talking to these circuits and reorganizing them. So yes, the blueprint comes to us because of genetics. But the eventual utilization of those blueprints in their detail is dependent on experience talking to your nervous system. Your experience is constantly talking to your nervous system and telling you what you need, what you don't need, how much you want to use, where you want to emphasize. So it is constantly changing. Okay. My personal hero in this field is Brenda Milner, okay, a student of uh, of uh, Penfield, and she was there at a time when one of the most unfortunate experiments of neuroscience happened. Okay, uh, Henry Gustav Molaisen, known to all of us who have ever studied a textbook as HM because we didn't know his name, was a patient who went to McGill. I'm going to skip this video because this video kind of destroys it for me. So I'm going to just skip it. Okay, so I'll not show you the video, but I'll tell you the story. So he went because he had intractable seizures. He was just constantly seizing, not able to even manage to eat. And it was really destructive because I felt bright, capable man, but it was not yet. Yeah. yeah. Severe evidence. So he goes and he went to a doctor called Scoville, who was also not at Montreal, but very close up. And Scoville did this bilateral removal of the hippocampus. So he just did that. He took out the hippocampus on both sides. And he became completely fine in terms of the epilepsy. So if you're saying, was it curative for the epilepsy? Yes, it completely cured the epilepsy. Unfortunately, HM could not make any new explicit memories. So, for example, he remembered where he was born, he remembered his name, he remembered where he had lived. Those are older explicit memories. When I say explicit, they are memories you can describe, you can declare, you can speak about. So I can speak about how to come to Sophia College. I can tell you, you go up this road, then you turn left, then you can tell you there's a tree in the garden, I can tell you, I can tell you things about this place. I can also tell you about my friends in this place, and who I know and who I've met. These are all explicit declarative memories. He lost the ability to acquire any new explicit declarative memories. Just impossible for him to make any new ones. And because he lost this so dramatically, he realized that the hippocampus is essential for making new memories. It's an unfortunate way of figuring this out, but that was actually the origin of why people started looking at the hippocampus. It's an example of a surgery induced lesion that changed the way the nervous system in the hippocampus was studied. Here's a picture of Henry Gustav Molaisen. Brenda Milner studied, worked with HM for more than 30 years. She's still very much alive. She's an amazing lady, one of the sort of heroes of psychology and neuroscience. And what she did is she would talk to him and interview him and interact with him. And uh, she would ask him questions. She would have to introduce herself every single day. She would walk in and say, hello, I am Dr. Brenda Milner, because you didn't remember that you had met her yesterday and the day before the day before. There was working memory enough to remember what you are seeing at this point. So for a period of time, you can keep stuff online. It's because you have an intact frontal cortex. So working memory is okay. But you lose explicit memory. So if you do this for too long, he's lost track of what happened a while in time. But for a period of time, while it's on working memory, he's still alright. So she would do this one particular example of a test with him, which was to draw a a star reflected in a mirror and he would draw it and over time he got better and better and better at drawing it but he didn't know he had ever done the test. So he didn't know that he had done the test but his motor learning improved dramatically because different circuits regulate motor learning. He didn't lose his ability to walk, he didn't lose his ability to move. Memories or learned events are stored in the stride and in other circuits. Older memories are stored in multiple places but the acquisition of spatial, explicit, and declarative memory requires the hippocampus, right? He changed the entire field after that. In fact, I have to tell you about the modern exponents of the mapmaker Dharana. We have talked about the most recent discovery uh, that got the well, recent discoveries that got the Nobel Prize, Edward Moser, Maybrit Moser, and John O'Keefe. Amongst the nicest neuroscientists to get it, so it's very nice that they got this, uh, this the Nobel. But they could not have known to look at the hippocampus.
practice without teaching. You want to know. Okay, you would not have known. And so there are interesting stories and tales, and unfortunately, we remove the stories from neuroscience, and we remove stories from science and our interaction with science, and we remove in the process, I believe, the magic of realizing that we are part of a journey, that we are part of a story that has existed long before us and will exist long after us. And it is in these stories that sometimes you realize how things are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? What John Okuki started off with was actually initially observing something which he thought was something was wrong. He kept me have noise in my experiment, I have noise in my he turned up the most pathway the study, but he was most irritated at the beginning because he thought he had noise. What did he do? So you take a rat, you put it in a little open field. So this is a little area, it's sitting, it's exploding, it's walking around, okay? It has electrodes in the brain, and this is a whole work of another piranha. The one that looked at the electrophysiology and networks and electrical properties of the nervous system, lots of electrical engineers, lots of physicists in that particular field, but that's a talk for another day. So this rat has this, this electrode, and then you allow to explore the space. And because you can record, you can record spikes or electrical activity of individual cells. And then you can also watch this animal with a camera. So you can first create, let's put a black. You can create a trace of where this animal has gone, right? So it has gone there, it has gone there, and it's a trace. And because it's a trace over time, it looks like this, so you can break it down at this moment where was the animal, because you have the whole record. Then you also remember that you have an electrode stuck in this brain region of the hippocampus, and what he would observe is when the animal was in this corner, there were particular sets of cells that always fired when the animal was in that corner. And different sets of cells would fire when it was in another corner. And what he began to realize is, hey, these cells in the hippocampus care about where the animal is. They are place cells. They carry information about space and territory. Okay? So for example, let's say you don't have that kind of a maze, you have this sort of a linear path. You have a cell that cares about when the animal is at this location, or this location, or this location. So it will only fire when the animal is sitting at the same. This cell will not fire when the animal is going to the other end. So you have place cells that can care about the location. The most dramatic example of it is right here. And you can actually now see what this looks like. There's a rat, the only looking maze, but here's the maze. This is from Matt Wilson's work. Here's a rat walking through this maze, and you can actually see what the animal is doing here. A play. So you can actually see what they're looking at. Neurons fire. A class of cells that they're labeled in blue, so you're calling them blue because you know the cell is firing. Blue cells care about this location. Stop firing. Still blue. Like blue set of cells here. You can tell the cell it is based on its electrical responses and how you're recording information. So you can actually do this in that way and look at which cells are firing. It's interesting because when rats go to sleep, Matt Wilson has done this beautiful work at MIT. When rats go to sleep and they enter REM sleep, which is the state in which we dream, and we can subjectively describe our dreams, rats and mice can't. In that state, they replay, they learn to maze, and there's a particular order of place cells that fire, let's say A, B, C, D, E, fall in that, in that order as it comes to the maze. When it is running through a maze, there's an order, in deep sleep, in REM, the same order replays. It replays in a speeded up fashion, it replays in a slowed down fashion. Sometimes it plays in such a speeded up fashion that your animal cannot physically run through the maze that fast. But it's really fast in that order. If you wake up the animal every time before it enters REM, which is from stage 4 before it's transiting from non REM to REM, you wake up the animal. Every time you can see the REM because you can make out the electrical activity, wake up the animal right before it's hitting REM. The animal has learned a maze, it will not remember. So you need REM for consolidation of memory. So you need the hippocampus for acquisition, you need place cells, replay. So spatial and temporal replay is needed. Now this is also known from psychology studies in humans in sleep labs, where you just won't let them get messed. They will get very messed up for other reasons also, but they can't remember and they can't learn very well. Okay, so somewhere there's a role for REM. We still don't really understand it, but this is the interface of the question of what's happening when you're dreaming, right? What is actually happening? Some of it may be actual activity replay. A beautiful work from Matt Wilson's lab and others. 
So what if we give your hippocampus a workout? Like we talked about your fingertips and getting them get the workout or other parts of your brain. If you give your brain a workout with structure change, can something that is so hardwired by the first run, which is the grave digger, find out, connect it, find out the connectome. Now I'm telling you, if you find out a connectome, the connectome could change. Is it worth finding out the connectome? Yes, it is. But it's also important to remain open to the possibility that you will change the connectome based on experience. So here's work from Eleanor McGuire. And what she did is she decided to study the most important subject, that's the drivers. They have to remember where everything is. So their spatial memory is getting a workout on a scale that you and I might have Of course, after Google Maps, so nobody's getting a spatial workout. But you know, we probably atrophy in our ability to find things because we are so dependent on this external brain that we have created for ourselves. So let's say you look at London taxi drivers who are required to pass the exam to be able to qualify to drive those black cabs that you see. Anyone who watches Sherlock will, uh, will admire that little black cab that's rushing through the street. So those guys, well, if you image their brains and you look at the volume of the hippocampus, the total volume of the hippocampus, then over time, if the longer you have trained as a taxi driver, the bigger your hippocampus volume. Now you can say, how interesting and relevant is this? But this is interesting because you see this across species. You see it in birds. Depending on how many seed storages they do, the ones that have a thousand plus seed caches, which they have to remember. Hey, that's where I stored my last food in that tree, and then the food before that was in that tree. Remember this map because you want to go back to the oldest food first because you go back at it. So you have to remember where you stored it and the sequence in which you stored it. The larger the cache, the bigger the bird's hippocampus. The smaller the cache, the smaller the hippocampus. So there is clearly possibility for total structural change. So I'm going to wrap with this quickly and say that the map maker Bharana, there are physicians. I started with stories about Brinda Penti and Broca and Bernie P, who are looking at patients. There are lots of psychologists, lots of people who spend their time talking and doing experiments with patients and a willingness to listen and watch. Electrical engineers, tons and tons of them because they do the recording. They have lots and lots of detailed recording. They are MRI and PET imaging people. And then there's my favorite community that wrote about this. Oliver Sachs, B.S. Ramachandran, people who carry this information out there and share the man. Oliver Sachs writes this incredible set of books where he talks for the man who mistook his wife for a hat. That's observations that are happening in the clinic. The understanding is, understand is eventually in neuroscience, but it's also important to put it out there. So there are writers in this community as well. So one thing that we realize from this particular dharana is use it or use it. What to do with your nervous system changes your nervous system. So how you engage with your universe changes the very thing with which you engage with your universe, right? So in that sense, this is perhaps the place where biology is most prone to interacting with the external world. Much more so than perhaps other sets of cells in your body. And these are the only cells that will hang around with you for the rest of your life. The rest of them are not, I mean, everything that you have is shed. Much of it will be gone over a period of time. These are the only cells that are really going to hang in there for largely the only cells that are going to hang in with you for your entire life. They're the most likely to listen to your external world and change their function and output based on the external world. So my last harana is the nasty star harana. I'm going to skip this harana. It's one of my favorites. But basically, it involved a whole bunch of people that looked at poisons. Yeah? So all those people who were making poisons and extracting poisons and using them and trying. Why does a cobra paralyze you? Anybody know? Toxins, right? But what are those toxins working on? They're working on neuromuscular junctions. Okay, so they block specific receptors without those finding out those toxins and figuring that out. So you have people from the earliest observations watching poisons and watching drugs. Drugs have been used in our journey with the world for as long as there has been us and the world. 
Okay, so people have been consuming stuff, people have been putting it into other people, people have been putting it into themselves. And in that process, they interrogated their own nervous system and other individuals' nervous systems. So I'll skip this, but I just want to show you one example of it. Who would be the current exponents? People like Toto Oliveira. Uh, Toto Oliveira is responsible for finding almost all the phone toxins in, in multiple phone spheres from the Pacific. Krishna, A.S. Krishna at Kriyakar made a similar attempt to span up and down the Indian Peninsula coastline and look for phone toxins coming from phone states. Now, you look at this innocuous looking feature and say, is this going to contain horrible poisons? But think about how it eats. It's got to get a fish and it's eat this fish. And the fish, look at the speed at which the fish travels and look at the speed at which this object travels. Extremely slow. So now there's no way it's going to catch any fish. Which means it has to kill the fish. And then the fish cannot be like dying so slowly that it goes one mile away and then falls down because then this thing will never catch. We find it, right? So it's unbelievable toxins. Once that are going to go in boom drop on top of your head or within like the right proximity. So the kind of toxins, only toxins and cone scales have. Also, by the way, that revolutionizes our management of pain. That's where the next class of pain management drugs is going to come from, rather than the opioids. It's this class of, of compounds that will do that. But I want to show you because we're not really end with it, okay? Um, look at it because you get a sense of what how this can do. Crawling along the ocean floor is a film snail. It looks harmless, but appearances can be deceiving. Four tubes jut out from the shell. The long one at the top, which it uses to inhale water and detect prey. The smaller ones on either side are its eyestalks, and in the middle, a deadly proboscis. So that happens. Concealed within the tip is a lethal weapon. Look at the hooky. In and it states, a harpoon loaded with a neurotoxic mix so complex there is no antivenom for it. It's armed with at least a hundred different toxins, more than any other creature. Arana that has been 
doing nasty stuff, they made nasty stuff, they got nasty stuff, they looked at other things, they took things, they put it into the brain, they tried to tweak things. There are some that are toy makers. Okay? And there are some that are inventors and problem solvers. A lot of toy makers in neuroscience who like to play with things and make something funky and put it into the brain and then look at what it does. So this, these guys, Ed Boyden and Carl Disroth, are perhaps toy makers are excellence. I mean, they just have another level change the field of neuroscience in the last 15 years, they've revolutionized it with the optogenetics technology. Brian Roth, who perhaps doesn't get his uh, you know, presence in the sun as much, one of the nicest people in neuroscience, uh, changed it with chemogenetics. So between opto and chemogenetics, you have tools that allow you to switch on neurons and switch off neurons under a certain degree of control. And that's what I'm going to show you in this particular video. And then we stop. Scientists can switch on the cells in this mouse's brain simply by switching on the light. The light activates nerve cells which make the animal walk in circles. This neat trick is also a powerful new tool. Using light to control the behavior of cells is teaching us about everything from how we wake up to how we learn. This is optogenetics. It all started with algae. In 2002, researchers discovered that a protein that causes green algae to swim towards or away from light is a light-sensitive channel. Blue light causes the channel to open, and positive ions then flood into the cell, much like the influx of ions that cause nerve cells to fire. Neuroscientists were quick to see the potential of these algal proteins. They realized that if they could get proteins called channel rhodopsins to work in mammalian nerve cells, they'd have a very precise way of controlling nerve activity in the brain. For many applications, this method would be better than drugs, which act too slowly, and better than electrical stimulation of the brain, which is less precise. Getting an algal protein into, for example, a mouse brain requires a bit of genetic engineering. First, you take the gene that encodes the protein, plus another piece of DNA called a promoter, and you put it in a virus. When the virus is injected into the mouse's brain, it infects neurons and delivers the gene. A chosen subset of those neurons will have the right machinery to activate the promoter, and in those cells, the algal protein is expressed in the cell membrane. To activate the protein, all you need is light, delivered by a fiber optic cable. It's the ability to target specific neurons in living, moving animals that makes this technique so powerful. And channel rhodopsins are not the only proteins in the optogenetics toolkit. In this slide, a different light sensitive system is used to target just two out of 200,000 neurons. These neurons govern an escape response the reflex that makes the fly flee as you move in to spot it. See the light, yeah. see the flash of light activates the neurons, making the fly jump and spread its wings. It can't take off because it's trapped in the petri dish. As well as activating neurons with light, scientists wanted to be able to silence them. Switching neurons off is just a case of using a different light-sensitive protein, such as halorhodopsin, and a different colour of light. Watch how this worm's workout is interrupted when a yellow light is switched on. The light activates halorhodopsin, triggering a flood of negative ions which inhibit the worm's motor neurons and stop it swimming. And neuroscientists aren't the only ones using optogenetics. As well as turning neurons on or off, a diversity of tools allow researchers to control many different processes in living animals and in cells in dishes. To beat to the light. These mouse heart cells have been engineered to beat in time to promises of light. And here, a light sensitive protein makes this spin cell move towards the laser. The applications are endless. Researchers have already used light to transform the stumbling of rats with Parkinson's disease into a steady walk and show which nerve cells fire when a sleeping mouse wakes. Optogenetics is shining light on everything from animal behavior to the interactions of proteins inside cells. 
That's why nature methods have selected optogenesis. This is perhaps the most dramatic example from Joshua Jennings' work. Here's a, a fiber optic cable into the hunger center, okay, the lateral hypothalamus. We already knew that was the hunger center from previous work, but you now optogenetically stimulate this in satiated animals, animals that are full and have fed. And you watch what happens when you start activating that and an input structure to this region called the BNST. Light on, sorry. Light on, animal speed. Light on, animal feeds. It's good, so animals don't eat when they're not hungry. But when you switch on the BNST to lateral hypothalamic stimulation, you will get it. Now, light off, the animal will slip the food, will walk away. Kind of checking it out, not eating. Light on. Because it's the eventual hypothalamic circuitry that con controls eating behavior. Those are the hunger centers, the satiety centers. If you stimulate the satiety centers, animals that are full, that are hungry, will not eat. Because you're creating a percept of satiation when there is no satiation. Okay, so obviously this opens up immense questions, right? Um, from the therapeutic point of view, of course, naturally people are excited about the possibility of taking individuals who are paraplegic and cannot walk with the possibility of optogenetic control for modulating circuits peripherally even though you've lost central control to allow for the possibility of movement. Yes, this allows us to interrogate the nervous system at a level and with a manner that hasn't happened for the last Fields. It's changing neuroscience every minute, right? But it also opens up questions of where will this go? In the combination of CRISPR-Cas9 with the possibility of bringing in chemogenetics that allows you to regulate activity of populations of neurons, it opens up a whole series of other questions. It begs more people to look at neuroscience. It begs for deeper interaction between the neuroscience community and the people at large. I love this quotation by Walter Cannon who says, only when we know what has been done by earlier computers can we judge the present scene. So hopefully today we meander to some garanas that I just made up, things that I enjoy thinking about. But think about how this will impact the community at large in the long run and the lack of engagement between the scientific community and the public that finds science is dangerous not only to the public, but it's also dangerous to science. It's dangerous if we don't talk, we don't constantly look at how we're doing science, what does it mean, what will be its implications, you know, where will this go? Yes, these tools are immensely powerful and should be used to explore the nervous system, but what will happen when we transition from basic science in the next 30 years to the clinic? What will that mean in terms of the challenges of these implications and applications of neuroscience? It's extremely important to continue our dialogue. And so it's great that you're doing this because we need to have those dialogues way more. We need them across the disciplines. We need them with people who think about ethics, people who think about philosophy, people who think about sociology and anthropology and culture. We need them in the lay public that funds us. And we need to start more of these dialogues. So I'm happy that we're, we're keep, keep starting that and to take questions. I'm sorry, I'm still in time. So, I'm, I'm sure uh, all of you have, uh, uh, all of you have taken up uh, into all these garanas, but uh, I understood, I mean, if I understood it correctly, I think uh, it's not good to be in one garana. Because you see, brain is complex, or life is complex, the world is complex. So we need to understand it from various perspectives. Structure is important, the building blocks are important, and that is like the first garana that she touched on. And then she looked at uh, the other garana, which is uh, the, uh, yeah, the map maker garana, which is actually my favorite garana. Because uh, I love topology, I love you know, mapping. Uh, making maps and uh, they work in mapping knowledge, so which is a very interesting thing. So I developed the second era, but doesn't 
mean that I ignore the others and that's my lesson for that. And the third one, which I thought she may be missing out, is also a very important thing. In fact, uh, the, the, some people, they, you know, uh, uh, the biology reaction, they talk about, you know, brain as a gland. You know, it secretes a lot of chemicals, a lot of drugs, and which is also the point that uh, she also touched upon. And uh, she also touched upon the last one after uh, biology. So, well, uh, I mean, I, I am not, of course, going to summarize. Uh, that is not a good idea to do. Uh, I am sure each of you must have summarized in your own way. So, we will have a uh, good length of time of interactions. So, now I think now the. Uh, there is no. We are not going to change the lights, but it is my time to eat uh, with it. So, the light is on. <laughs> like the horse is starting it. So ask questions. You can use this mic for the audience and that mic for the reader. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Please introduce yourself first. Uh, my name is Arvind and I work uh, at uh, an R and D lab in IIT. So I'm an electrical engineer by um, you you showed us a slide for that that mind blowing and mind transparent defining thing. Uh, the, the sample clarity. Uh, so, a couple of doubts on that. Um, if I understand it properly, they, so when they say you, the fat is the opaque part, is that the phospholipid bilayer? Yes, yes, it's the phospholipid bilayer, but it's, it's more than just only phospholipids, it's the spectrum of lipids that you have which occlude most of the life. Um, you will have, of course, some occlusion with the proteins as well, but the big occlusion happens because of all the lipids that you have within the nervous system. Right, but do you, so, uh, if you destroy it, that, I mean, that's the cell wall. So if you do that, then how do you? You you hold, uh, you have to replace by creating the hydrogen, which is what they actually use electrically at that point in time to actually get across the entire tissue. And then you dissolve using lipid dissolving agents. Um, the idea is that you provide enough hydrogen related support that it actually maintains the integrity to a large extent. Of course, you get shape change to some extent. You cannot completely prevent some degree of shrinkage or some degree of local expansion, but it's still enough for you to get the broad architecture right. So, when you have one cell, you have to fill over into another space and then you can still identify cells. You can go totally. You can absolutely identify cellular boundaries. If you have, for example, a red cell next to a green cell, you can actually see those boundaries and you can see those projections quite distinctly. And related to that is, uh, you, so you're sending the same kind of proteins and it's, uh, it's kind of a mass infection, it's not one infected in particular neuron. So, how does this, the individual with one particular neurotype, how does cells then stay different in different colors? Okay, good. You asked me a question about where the, how do I put, how do the people put scissors into different cells, right? So, let's say you've got red, green, and blue, three different genes present in any individual cell. You have to use different combinations to cut out different things. And now, one animal has the same broad genotype. But you can drive the scissors in different classes of cells by using different promoters. So for example, I have an inhibitory interneuron. Okay, it's only doing inhibition, it's a GABAergic neuron. So I know that it has to be making the GABA-producing enzyme. So you have the promoter for the GABA-producing enzyme, the GAD pathway, and you drive the scissor, which is the pre recombinase under the control of that GABA promoter. So now that particular scissor will only be made in inhibitory interneurons. So even though you have the same genotype as a neighboring excitatory cell, you don't have a scissor. So the scissor that you would use will be different in different cell types, and so you can chop differently. So you can get your inhibitory neuron to be red, and you can have a bad neighbor excitatory neuron to express another scissor and be yellow, blue, whatever. So yeah, it's, it's genetic tools to dry the scissors differently. And just last one, yeah. uh, so even carrying on from the same slide, there was one slide that showed a uh, live cell. Yes. It was still live. Yes, yes, so it's a slice. It's an uh, about 200 micron thick slice that is being maintained as an explant culture, so you can actually watch things. So that doesn't mean hydrogen. No, that's not. But it, you, can, you can still penetrate through it. Thank you. Thank the thought of the AP. So, uh, you told that uh, 
practice can uh, by practice we can change the assignment from the regular also the brain, right? So in the detail, not in their entirety, but in the detail. In the detail. So my thing is can can this process, can this process be helpful for a total community? Suppose a particular community is put to a particular environment practicing a particular uh, set of words for a long time, long time and up. So can this be inherited by uh, generation to generation uh, by practices? Well, that's an interesting question that you're asking, which is do you carry uh, nervous system marks of practices that people, that your ancestors did in a sense, right? You're evoking the mark. We were having this conversation just a little while back. Um, for the longest time, people thought absolutely not in any way and not in any form, right? Certainly, you can imagine that if you had a set of experiences in your own early life, you may carry modifications in your own genome, which are called epigenetic modifications, at the level of your own different cells, which causes the change in the way those genes are expressing proteins in your own lifespan. Now, you're asking if this generation experience experiencing a set of things can influence the next generation's experience of its environment. One would have almost thought absolutely not, but the evidence in the last sort of 15 years suggests that we could really look at that idea. There's no question that certain things are leaving epigenetic marks in the genome. So for example, I'll give you an example of work actually done by a um, former master student, Ryan uh, Dias in my lab, who's now a young assistant professor at, uh, at Emory. So what he did is he took male mice and he subjected them to a shock treatment that was paired with a particular odor. So a neutral odor, which the animal doesn't care about, but you pair that odor with a shock and now that odor becomes extremely aversive because you learn to associate that odor with a shock. So now whenever you smell that odor, you would avoid that odor at all costs, right? So you would try to escape from that odor. So you learn, you teach the animal to pair a neutral odor with an aversive experience. Then you wait for a few weeks and you let the sperm or you let the male mouse impregnate a female or you take the sperm and you can artificially inseminate. So there are multiple ways by which you can do this. He let them mate after a couple of weeks. Then he looked at not the F1, which is the next generation, but the generation after that, so the grandchildren of the, those mates. Right? So those mice, now you expose them to the same odor, an odor that they have never seen before, and so it should be neutral. But you get aversive responses to an odor that they have not been trained in with, but was trained two generations before. That's really surprising, and it was controversial and continues to attract a lot of attention as to what does this mean? But when you look at the receptor for this particular odor, that's an M71 receptor, you can see how it's represented in the olfactory bulb. You can actually image it. Grand, so the babies two generations down, so F2 has this big increase in representation of the M71 receptor as a consequence of an experience two generations before, right? We don't understand why it's happening. Light reach for methylation changes in the sperm that sit upstream. Now, but that's at the level of sperm. How did that translate into cells? That means every cell inherited from that originally, which eventually creates the olfactory area, has to continue to show this change and the olfactory bulb get this big increase. A lot is not understood yet, but we know that if you take individuals and you stress them, and you look at the sperm of males that have been stressed, and you look at two sides from females that have been stressed, they carry many microRNAs that are modulated as a consequence of the experience of stress. You can take those microRNAs, stick them into a completely separate two site pseudo pregnant female implant, and you will see behavioral changes in pups born that are carried. So, from there to go to us is a massive, right? A massive. But people have attempted studies in humans where they've looked at grandkids or they've looked at Holocaust survivors and they've looked at individuals. Now what we don't know is does this in a sense for a short period of time allow uh, experience and a history of recent experience of your prior generations to allow for local quick adaptation or resilience or vulnerability is that what it's contributing to we really don't know. This is a very nascent area and quickly make a jump from what is known in animals to human is I think very premature but what I think that the field is telling us is we need to look. We need to look much more carefully and so I will not preclude the possibility that experience can leave marks that are not restricted to the
the present generation, but that can be transgenerationally. The evidence is certainly pointing in that direction with some of the examples that we are beginning to see. So it is possible you may, at least for a short set of genomes, we've done the experiment across multiple genomes. We need to do those experiments. We need to probe it in its entirety. How easily is this erasable? How robust is it? If you've waited longer than two weeks after that shock training and waited two months and done it, would you have seen the same thing? You don't know. Nobody's done that experiment, so you don't know the answer to that. So what we've done with this experiment, at least we can say something. But the whole sort of extension of what's the rate at which sperm is turning over, how long do these marks last, how robust are these marks, how much do they transmit, don't know the answer. Yeah? yeah? Okay. Famine effect with the Dutch famine, absolutely. So if you've eaten you have to eat potatoes, the Dutch family, they just, that's what they survived on. You look at uh, the second generation down, Uruguay survivors, famine survivors, you see marks on the genome that indicate that genes that are associated with metabolic processing are carrying modifications upstream of those genes which are likely to have that, which are likely to be so I won't repeat the cost. It's just telling you that experience is in constant dialogue with your body, not just your nervous system, but with all other organs as well. And that there are ways by which experience is modifying way more than one begins to realize. The tip of the iceberg is this realization. So we still have lots left. Thank you, Dr. Vidya, for your uh, captivating talk on this. Uh, so myself, Shabhi Rupa from Nursing uh, I have a little play. So regarding the Rupa's aphasia, uh, regarding his aphasia, uh, I was interested in knowing uh, what is the line of treatment for these patients and whether optogenetics can actually be used uh, for treating them and what will be the timeline? Uh, no, I mean, they, they, so with Rupa's and Verniki, the treatments are just to Presumably, do as much therapy that you can because if there's a lesion and it's a massive lesion, you can only look at how much you can repair or allow plasticity sufficient that you can allow a little bit of the function to be ameliorated. What well, so oxygen has to be improved uh, by the optogenetics? So uh, it's not the place where optogenetics will go first. Part of the problem is you need neurons in that circuit to cause them to get activated. Um, Nobody's done optogenetics. Optogenetics is still in the stage of not even transiting to monkey, right? And it won't be where people go first because those if cells are there, you can't do anything. I mean, that circuit is already, you will need cells that you can repair. The place that optogenetics will probably go first is spinal cord injury. It's the most obvious one, partly because in spinal cord injury, your central pattern generators, which are in your back, are often intact. What you lost is control. You lost the connection here. So depending on whether you're quadriplegic or paraplegic, and it's the most common injury amongst young. When we became bipeds, we went like this and we developed this nice long neck. The problem is we created a conduit through which all the information is processed down. And this is highly vulnerable to whiplash, to being chalked. So the problem with that is you can lose contact and information. I can't stand here. I can stand for some time using my central parameter. Now if you put a rocking floor underneath me or slightly jack, I can't do without my center. Because I have to change the amount of tone that my joints and everything is doing to allow me to even balance. So this is where machine interface stuff will happen. It's the place where the machine interface stuff is definitely going to happen first, which is you get the implants in the spinal cord. Now you have to take input back from your muscle and you've got to adjust accordingly and allow, because in rodents which are quadriplegic, people have already put in optogenetic things and animals can walk. So that's why it will go first. It's unlikely to go to circuits which are deep circuits in the brain. Remember for optogenetics, you need a fiber optic cable. So while it's easier to imagine in the spinal cord, you can't imagine this part yet. Chemogenetics is why people got interested in the idea that you could, with some tools, go at least to superficial structures and activate them. But that's again a while away, a while. Thank you, sir. So, uh, okay, I'll try and So, there's a recent concept of cellular memory that has come to the So, what was the benefit is different from memory in what is the brain? So, like, if a cell has been cultured in plastic and then, so there are two different kinds of ways that the two different cells are acquired, one in plastic and then, 
when you take the cell from gel onto the plastic and continue to cell shape the plastic, it continues to behave in the way that it has been behaving when it goes on the cell. So what is the effect? So it's retaining information about its environment. The environment is sculpture which is resulting in possibly and there's an addition expert right there behind you who will tell you about what happens huh? so the same oh okay so you know you you essentially have stuff where things stick to surfaces and as a consequence of that there's obviously information about what you adhere to that a cell is responding to and modulating the expression of its own proteins that's not necessarily the same at all as memory within the nervous system where you're talking about networks remembering in a sense a prior experience and changing the degree of strength between synapses. So the ability of one synapse to stimulate another synapse is altered in weight. Either you have a stronger ability of stimulating or a weaker ability. That's one way to think about it. Eventually for that to happen you still have to change phosphorylation of proteins, insertion of channels, uh, you know, essentially certain things like that have to change. Those are likely to be universal things. Right? The ability to eventually cause functional or plastic response changes that involve protein modulation. So, maybe I gave you a very confusing answer. The underlying mechanisms which involve gene expression changes, protein phosphorylation and biochemical changes are common to any cell responding to its environment. In electrically active cells, which is what the nervous system cells and muscle cells are, for example, you could change the strength with which a cell responds to a particular stimulus. That's what we are talking about when we talk about network level mechanisms. That is not true for a skin cell, for example. Even though it is basics, you still get gene expression, you still get protein expression that drives that. It's not number of synapses, it's the weight of a synapse, which is essentially if I give you a particular presynaptic stimulus for let's say a certain degree of a presynaptic stimulus, one action potential time to your presynaptic, what is the strength of the postsynaptic response? That can vary. So for example, for one action potential, I get a particular degree of depolarization. I can now for the very same stimulus get a much stronger response for a completely attenuated response. I'm changing the strength, strength of that same synaptic contact. And that could be two synapses bang next to each other on a dendrite, where one synapse is strengthened and one synapse is unaffected. So it's the same dendritic stress, same neuron, but two different synapses. It's not the all It's not, because eventually that's your all or nothing is output at the level of an action potential. But for the cell to decide whether it will fire an action potential or not, that's to compute the strength of all of its inputs, right, eventually. And so that's where you allow certain synapses to drive the cell way more, and you can silence other synapses and actually shut them. Drive and to suppress pain perception. 
So we will simultaneously increase aggressive drive and block pain perception. Those are the hardest patients that you have or hardest people you have in a sense to deal with. The fact that chemicals can block pain percept, we already know. That's why we take analgesics, right? So the idea that an analgesic can help you process pain is something that humankind knew even before there was Saradon or opiates. People were self-medicating themselves to ensure that they could control pain for a very long period of time. Once we knew what controlled pain, we found ways to employ it and use it. I have no idea, you know, I mean, controlled experiments of asking whether skin will burn differentially if you have plain blockade, depending on what you do, I have no idea. So I don't know if I can really answer no, that. No, is there. I, I would like to answer that because I walked on fire. Because I can, there, there is absolutely no reason why there is nothing like two kinds of people or three kinds of people who can walk. All of us can walk. Uh, and of course, you know, it's not like a long walk that you know, it's like a kilometer of amber that you play on in front of you. It just took you eat. And all of us can do it. And it has to be done only on amber, which is very, very thick and no ash at all. That's why they keep, uh, you know, for example, take off all the, you know, they blow off wind and, you know, make sure that there's nothing that sticks to your feet. And if, of course, it sticks to your feet, it's going to burn. So you basically make sure that, you know, all that is uh, completely, you know, and because it's psychologically it's very red, and therefore there's fear. The moment you take away the fear, all of us can walk. And, uh, of course, you can't walk long way, long distance. I mean, it, everyone will get it. It's just a uh, kind of small uh, trick that we will play. Yeah, I mean, and so I would agree. We do this on a routine basis when we go into minus 70 uh, freezers and burn our fingers. So we all figured out that different students have different degree of pain tolerance. They go in and dig, uh, dig out samples from freezing temperatures, which by the way are excruciatingly painful. But for a short period of time, absolutely you can do it. And after a while, your fingers are a frozen solid and you're jumping around and you're trying to get blood supply back into your fingertips. So that varies. There are people who will start jumping in two seconds and there will be people who will do it for 10 minutes and then jump after 10 minutes saying my hands are hurting like crazy. So some of it is just purely that. I would wonder how long and for what temperature you're actually perceiving. That's that's a better test, right? In animals you can test this. So you we do a four paw withdrawal, hot plate, the animal puts a paw on it, you get an immediate withdrawal. If you use an analgesic, you increase the duration of time the animal can spend it with its four paws. So that's that there are ways by which you can block pain beautiful. Do it in animals, you can do it with stuff you take. You can also do it with one of the cutest little experiments, which I love, the gate control theory. There's a reason why when somebody hurts themselves, you go and touch them and you press them and you do this, right? It's an instinctive reaction, but actually, C, so C fibers are what carry pain. Contact is carried by myelinated fibers that carry information faster. So if you touch yourself and you immediately do this, it really, so if you stung yourself, the best way to describe it is women who go and get themselves back. There's a reason why somebody goes and does this to your hand immediately after, because after you yanked out the air and it hurts, this hand blocks the perception of pain because there's a gait control at the level of the spinal cord where pressure acts to ameliorate the effect of the slower conducting pain pathway because pressure will block the pain immediately at the level of the spinal cord. That's a great example. There's a reason why mother's kisses and hugs probably work very effectively or anybody's kisses and hugs work very effectively because you're blocking, blocking the pain at the level of the spinal cord. So yeah, gait control mechanisms are interesting.
you to do resolution and uh, you know you will change the scale at which you can image and you can easily so you can use confocal approaches you can actually penetrate through and look through so yes that, that's actual that's real that's a real mouse brain that's real gfp positive neurons and that well yes because most of them in many cases they are dead. most of that is usually done in light sheet microscopy so that's what people are routinely using. People use confocal microscopy, depending on what you're looking at. But confocal doesn't necessarily always require the clarity. For clarity, if you want larger scale imaging, if everything is in the millimeter scale, then you obviously also need to be able to get resolution and detail at the same time. Catch all of this, though. He'll tell you about the technology of light sheet microscopy. So yes, I mean, there is some degree of post-processing, but that's actually real. Yeah, those are actually real. It's not artistic rendition, let's put it that way, those are real new maps, yeah. Ensemble replay 
and this replay of activities seems to be very important for learning and consolidation. So that's the current level of understanding. There's also obviously all this speeding up, throwing down, disconnected things, getting connected to it. But we know from human studies with, with psychologists that if you don't allow people to have REM sleep steadily, then you have obvious series of problems as far as learning and also a whole bunch of other things. A lot of metabolic changes, lots of other things also. So, and so that, that's interesting. This REM, the best REM happens in the early hours of the morning. Right? You have to get to sleep well enough to go through a few cycles of REM that you come out of and the REM is initially shorter and the deeper REM happens later. And if you sleep like at 4 o'clock at night and get up at 7, then your, your REM, so quality of sleep is critical and we don't really know how much quality sleep we are getting as a species currently, right? Quality sleep is really getting compromised. So it's a huge consolidator of a lot of brain function and brain control of metabolism. So not sleeping is probably one of the singular most important things for a healthcare crisis. Not sleeping and not sleeping well. I'm originally from Ayurveda. So, um, beautiful to talk about it today. So, I have two questions. First one is probably that the, I'm getting a bit away from the design, but the science is not. Because in your job, you have kind of covered, you know, the uh, uh, brain bigger to the giant, the two diseases. So, that, I mean, if I take the example from your talk only, that they are bigger than that. They did not know, or those scientists, they did not know that. I mean, what will the application eventually come the lab? So, I would like you to yeah, comment on the basic research versus useful research, for example, that I'm going to do on this day. That's my first question. And the second question is, nowadays we are kind of very prone to kind of deep, shorter, deep, That's small question. <laughs> 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, you know that the um, uh, Twitter, Facebook, very short thing. Now, look, is that kind of... Um, Affecting our ability to do the longer reading and comprehension. Okay, I'll have the first one. So, uh, in the past, when one. people did uh, science, they did it usually funded by patrons, or they did it funded of their own pocket, or they were playing around in their kitchens, or they were playing around in teaching areas or universities. But it was not such a large funded enterprise, right? If you look at the history of science, Funding came from many different sources. Over the last sort of 60, 70 years, you've seen at least in biomedical science and other science, but biomedical science more so than in others, big science, experimental physics, etc. Funding quantum going up dramatically. So now you have a large mass of the tax paying public contributing to science done this way and on this scale. In the past, it the patrons, perhaps. Right? And also our resource utilization and technology and tools have gone for a scale which is significantly more expensive. Which is why you get the question as to whether it is justified to spend this large amount of money when you can't see an obvious return. Where is this investment? I'm not seeing a return in the time scale that I am imagining. And quick return. And is it really worth it? Right, which is why even though people say, why does it matter somebody studies decision making and apply, is it even going to be remotely applicable to me? Or why should you go and do this clarity and find out something? How is this even remotely relevant to me? Um, there's an onus of responsibility both ways. One is there's an onus of responsibility on us as the community that is at the receiving end of this large amount of funding. We cannot receive this funding without being aware that we are indebted to a mass of people allowing us this freedom to do our science, which means that the responsibility is on us to do science communication. We cannot treat it as a, a side activity or a peripheral activity or an activity that only some scientists should do that. The rest of us are, are pure practitioners of this art and so it's not upon us. When you took taxpayer money to do what you're doing, it funds our graduate students, it funds our work, it funds everything that we do. It is our absolute imperative responsibility to communicate why this work is important and, and, and really relevant. And also to communicate how somebody studying cone snails along the coastline of Goa may find something like, why are you studying these silly snails, how is this going to be relevant? And if that ends up becoming pain medication for 
how do you prepare for patients who have no other response available to them? Opioid analgesics are not taking care of the major pain crisis we have on this planet. Not. You know, diabetic neuropathy, neuropathy, you can't handle it. You can't be giving opiates to people. It's just not possible, right? So where are your next generation of pain drugs going to come from? Are they going to come from only people who say, I study pain and I will find a drug that treats pain? Or maybe it will come from that person who's studying a form, say, in a zoology department somewhere. So how do you know where that find is? When you look at the history of things that have impacted society at large and their origins are often really convoluted. And that's why I wanted to call this meandering. Because it is in the meandering that the findings have come. It is not in these more directed, large that often those findings have come through these meandering ways. People coming together, talking something, you find some strange, interesting observation and that becomes something that has a huge impact. It may also not have an impact on human lives. It may have an impact on us as a species exploring the universe. Thinking about it, our thought process and engagement with broader and bigger thoughts. So, but this is to not take away the absolute onus of responsibility on the scientific community to communicate more effectively, more often, and to reduce this distance. It is on us. We cannot turn around and say, you know, you wanted us to do the science, but now it's your job to find out what we do. It is really unacceptable as an argument to say, it's really up to you. I can't even waste my breath and time to make what I do, which is so esoteric, possibly communicable and easy for you to understand. It is on us. So unless we do it, we will create a huge gap of distance and a distance where there is mistrust because we are making the presumption that people are not willing to listen to us, we are not willing to talk to them. So unless we do that, so I feel very strongly that the onus is hands-on on the scientific community. It's very different from doing kitchen science where you are funding yourself. For somebody somewhere, that this is their money that's been dedicated to this enterprise. We have a lot of responsibility to communicate with that. So I think that and also to communicate why we think the velocity driven fundamental basic science has such an important place. Because if we share these stories, it will be obvious to people that it was not these, often not these very driven projects that resulted in fundamentals. And the video will be Second one. Um, so, you know, the best way I'll describe it is if the, most of us in this room, especially the ones of us who switched over to using the computer, if somebody makes you write a six hour written exam with your hand, you will struggle. You just won't be able to do it fast enough. Like, all of us go back to like ICSC or SSC exam and have to do in 10 days fast writing, you won't be able to do it. Our handwriting, our ability to write is not, but we're not writing constantly, right? So, you lose skill if you don't use it. Of course, right? So, yes, you and I cannot read vowel absent language. I struggle and I'm like, what is this person to say? I can't understand. What is this word? Where are the vowels? I can't find the vowels. But this is not true for a whole generation of other people who are now happily dropping vowels left, right, and center and communicating without, you know, any problem with the vowels drop. I don't like uh, the presumption of the previous generation already saying, oh, this generation's music is useless, this generation's language and literature is useless. It's a very easy thing to go down that particular road. But there's no question that if you do not utilize certain skills, you will lose those skills. There's no question. You don't utilize them sufficiently and you especially don't utilize them for long stretches of early periods of time. Reading is one such skill. It used to be our access to the universe. It was our ability to imagine worlds that we did not live in, but we could be exposed to through the written world, right? And the less we do that, and the more we have a problem with Twitter and all of this is it tells you what you want to hear. You follow what is going to echo your thought, you express your thought and you speak in an echo chamber. They are echo chambers. Every now and then you might find somebody from another echo chamber showing up. But they're largely huge echo chambers. Everybody's talking to them are very happy. We're all in agreement. And then suddenly somebody shows up and you're a moron. All that you think about the universe is all wrong. But it's echo chambers. Whereas in reading, because you have the option of looking at a very different way of thought, you are forced without a fight and without saying how many likes did you get and how many likes I am going to kill you. You're a horrible human being. How can you express an opinion which is the opposite to mine? You have the chance to listen to dissenting voice. So we have less space for dissenting voice. We need sociologists. We need anthropologists, 
people who discuss and look at human mobility, why are we a shrinking space for dissenting words? Nobody is allowed to have an opinion that comes with you unless you create that person as a horrible individual who has no thought that it, we, have, we can't exist in echo chambers. And the scientific community also cannot exist in an echo chamber. If we hear criticisms that make us uncomfortable, those are the very criticisms we should listen to. That's where movement happens. We've got to listen. We can't take the views of the humans. That's sort of the difficult question for me. I don't have a question. I wanted to echo your comments on what Abhishek said. Abhishek's first question. That is, uh, you've done a very poor job of communicating this. I can't hear you, Sora. We did this as a biomedical scientific community. It is on us 
to look at our own house and clean it up. And if we're not even willing to say we need a house that needs clean up, we are just perfect to begin with and we're already perfect and we will stay perfect and we should just be so grateful we exist amongst you that we are thinkers of this scale. That's the risk. And we're not, as a scientific community, we are threatened to some extent because we suddenly feel people asking us why do you exist, why do we need money, why are we doing what we do. But are we willing to clean up our own ship? Are we willing to call those out amongst our own community who are arrogant in their way of interrogating the universe or whatever nature, right? And then we cannot stand on a pulpit. We are part of the human journey. We are also humans with our own flaws. We have we carry our points of view. There is a reason why those Tuskegee trials happen because this is racist America. This is a time. There's a reason that happened. We carry our biases as a community with us. So as scientists to say, I, because I'm a scientist, I am immune by definition to bias, to racism, to sexism. I have no more biases, not because I'm a deeper mind, I am thinking deeper, I am thinking beyond. That is not true. So this, if we don't do, nobody else, I mean, it will come imposed on us. And when it comes imposed, it will be ugly. Because it will be baby and bath water. We will throw out the scientific enterprise, the scientific journey, because we are unwilling to look at our own mistakes and what we carry with us. We've got to be open to criticism. We critical thought is scientific language. But when somebody criticizes us, we are like, no, oh, how can you say this? We're not willing to listen to criticism. So that is something where I feel by divorcing the humanities from the sciences completely, by breaking down dialogue and siloing it so much. You have reduced the possibility for discourse where people can criticize us and say, hey, we appreciate you, but you haven't thought about this. Have you thought about the nuances of what this would mean? We want to listen. So, just, uh, so let, let, let us ask about that. So, we need to stop over policy. Uh, yes, over promising. So, when the human genome was sequenced, someone actually went down and said it would solve the problem of homelessness. Wow. Would solve the problem of homelessness. Yes. So that's the sort of rubbish that gets us in trouble. Yeah, it is a thing. And, and, and we are paying for the people who said that. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we got the last word. And I think it is a Okay, Vinita, as usual, thank you for this marvelous job. Uh, I think uh, Vidita is always like that Perkinji you said. Know? You start at a point and then you, you don't know it's just the emergence. And uh, maybe more like a pyramidal set, but uh, I think that was an example that was very catchy. And uh, I think, yeah, we start off with a point and you moved all the things we did. That was fine. So thank you for this marvelous job. Uh, as balanced as ever, as the Perkinji said, okay, it was. Um, uh, I want to thank the audience also very much for your participation. And when we have some other sessions like this, do please join us. Uh, the University uh, Circle and the Google Global Science Center, particularly uh, because they brought us uh, this uh, talk. Uh, yes, and uh, thanks for, to everybody.